Zoe from New York. I'm sorry, I'm like trying to keep up. Madison, Wisconsin, what's good? <laughs> Brookfield, Vermont. Tucson, Arizona. Let's give it one more minute. And you can also put in here, I'm really interested, Chicago, hashtag vote pro choice <laughs> from Carly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, They're all required to attend. <laughs> um, and let us know too, like, what are you, what brought you here? What brought you here tonight? Like, what's interesting? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to let you all know right now that allergies have gotten the best of you, so I apologize if you catch a sneeze from me. Vote pro choice endorsed candidate Lani 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 Frank Jessica Krant NYC vote pro choice team DC Nayral Morgan Trevitt hey okay Minocqua Wisconsin come through Wisconsin I see you <laughs> Rena from Atlanta Georgia the blue future team well, let's get started because we don't have much time. We've got 60 minutes um, and that'll feel like less time as time goes on. So I just want to say thanks to everyone for coming tonight. This is um, a topic that has been very near and dear to my heart as I've been very um, alarmed at, you know, kind of the state of play and what's been going on with, you know, reproductive freedom in the time of coronavirus, um, which is why I was so happy that we were um, able to pull this panel together due to the diligent organizing of my co-moderator, um, Heidi Seek, who is just one of my favorite humans in general, um, and just a lovely human to be with, but also to be thinking with and um, working with on these issues. So thanks so much to everybody. And we're also going to be introducing you to um, the rest of our panel, which we are very lucky to um, have a group of really distinguished folks with us today. Um, to talk about what it really means to be wrestling with and fighting for reproductive freedom in the time of COVID-19. Um, and so what we're going to do today is really talk about reproductive freedom and the way that it's at stake in this pandemic, um, including the ways that governors have used uh, COVID-19 to ban abortion and the ways in which the Supreme Court is um, approaching it and hearing cases to limit our freedom, including cases that happened this week. Um, so what we want to really talk about today is what's actually happening, um, because right before you all got on, we were saying there's a, a real need right now to hear what is really going on and how do we just get clear and orient ourselves in this moment. And um, so that's really what we hope that we can do today. Here's here are the facts on the ground. Here are the solutions and the calls to action that a number of people have identified. And we're also interested in anything that you have that is successful that you could pop into the chat and um, calls to actions and solutions. What are our next steps? How do we build power together? How do we move forward together? Um, and, and what does winning and victory look like? So that's what we're gonna be doing on this webinar um, today. And we're gonna be doing this with, uh, as I said, an illustrious group of panelists. Um, I've been on their webinars already this week and I was like, ooh, she's fire. So <laughs> I was really excited when I saw all of the lineup here as this has been shaping up over the last couple of weeks. So um, I wanna introduce them to you and then we'll actually just dive in. Um, so the first person who will be talking is Brianna Twofoot, who's from Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Um, she goes by pronouns she, hers. Um, the next person that will be talking is Representative Celia Israel from Texas House of Representatives, coming from Austin, Texas. Um, Jordan Goldberg from the National Institute of Reproductive Health, also she, her, and so is Rep Israel. And finally, but last but not least, Mary Drummer from Move On, hey, she, her, um, who will be talking to us um, to, to kind of round out the, the conversation and we'll be talking about actions and how we get involved. Um, so I want to just dig into the meat of this. So without further ado, we're going to begin at the beginning um, and holler out any questions that you have in the Q&A box. Please try to keep the chat for chat and the Q&A for Q&A. And then we will make sure to get as many questions in as we can in that section. Thanks, everyone. 
Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm Heidi Seek, the CEO and co-founder of Vote Pro Choice. My pronouns are she, her. And it's very important um, for us to be having this conversation. I just want to thank all of the panelists and the Women's March. We must be working in partnership right now because reproductive freedom is truly at stake. And I just want to frame for a minute, um, we, it, it, we're being um, threatened at every level, in every way, at every level of government right now. And that may seem like it's been something new that we've all discovered, but the fact of the matter is this, is a, this has been a long time coming. And as a person who has been working in the reproductive rights community now for 30 years, my very, very first job in college was Planned Parenthood of Lincoln, Nebraska in 1989. And I can tell you, I have been watching the slow chipping away of our reproductive freedom for that long. This is a political strategy of a small number of anti-choice conservatives who want to win elections. And so they must mobilize this anti-choice um, minority of people to be able to um, stay to, so they can win. And so that's what we're seeing. A, a massive amount of investment has gone into leadership development, policy development, judicial um, recruitment, placing judges in um, judicial appointments, and getting these folks elected in every race everywhere over the last thir over the the last 30 years. So we're here because of this investment in infrastructure, protest infrastructure, leadership infrastructure. But the fact of the matter is, we are a pro-choice nation. Uh, nearly 80% of the people in this country do not want reproductive freedom. They want reproductive freedom. They do not want Roe v. Wade overturned. And so we are at a crossroads right now of this anti-choice infrastructure and the reality of this country. And it's come to fruition and to a real turning point now in this pandemic. So tonight we're gonna to talk about like, what is the actual situation status and what can we do about it? So I am so excited to welcome my colleague and um, resistor in the movement, Brianna Twofoot, who is just joined Planned Parenthood as the new national organizing director, who's gonna tell us um, what we need to know about what's happening now. Sure, thanks Heidi. Um, and hi everyone on the phone. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the world as I see it from where I sit now. Um, but so many of you on the phone have um, information and I don't purport to know anything about, you know, every everything about anything. So if you've got info, feel free to chat it in as well. And I know um, the amazing other colleagues on the panel are also going to have a lot of info to share with you that no doubt will be important to you taking action. I'm also going to just proactively accept the grace at some point. I'm sure you're going to hear my dog bark at some wildlife that is outside and I'm just gonna, that's just gonna be okay. Um, so I'd like to share some context both from my place as an organizer and as a colleague at Planned Parenthood and I sort of think about this context both for our issue and for the people we aim to serve. Um, so let me start with the people, because as an organizer, that's, that's always the thing that's on my mind. Um, women, trans women, and their families have been incredibly hard hit in this crisis in a number of ways. And I want to shout out colleagues at organizations like Moms Rising, Women's March, Ultraviolet, Supermajority, NARAL, Vote Pro Choice. There are so many great organizations um, who have kept an eye on how COVID is uniquely impacting women and girls and trans women. And they're um, combining efforts to, to really shine a light on that. So a few top line examples of how women are impacted. Women held 60% of the jobs that we've already lost, and that's as of a week ago. Women make up 73% of the healthcare workers infected with COVID-19. 73% of the people who are on the front line taking care of sick folks um, are women. And we know that women are often primary caregivers to children. And in this current reality where the vast majority of schools are closed and children and teachers are navigating distance learning for the first time, and where women have jobs or had many of the jobs that we've lost, the burden of that is often falling on women in the home. Um, so when I think about our people, defining our people as women, trans women and their families and communities, they're hurting and they need us now more than ever. 
Um, and even as they're hurting in this um, really challenging reality, their rights are also under attack. So I'm gonna talk about that at a high level. Um, I'm gonna shout out Jordan, who you're all gonna hear from in a little bit, who has taught me so many policy things when it comes to reproductive rights. But here's what I've seen at Planned Parenthood. So we're facing, we were always facing two um, court cases at the Supreme Court, which is no longer composed of folks who um, are in favor of our issue. So June Medical v. Russo, I know many of you on the phone know about this, is a case that could pave the way for states to effectively ban abortion for many people across the country. It's the first time Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch will hear oral arguments in an abortion-related case, or, or heard oral arguments in this case. Um, and it could open the floodgates to medically unnecessary state abortion restrictions and gut protections in Roe. So that case was argued in early March. Um, you know, we're waiting for a decision. It could come at any point, uh, potentially in the month of June. Um, and, you know, we're going to see what the impact is there. This week, just days before the 60th anniversary of the birth control pill, SCOTUS is considering two Trump administration rules that would allow bosses and universities, because of their personal objections, to decide whether their health insurance plans cover birth control, um, either for students or employees. So in the courts, at the Supreme Court level, those are two cases that um, both around access to abortion and um, birth control really uh, pose a threat to our rights. Um, and that's not the only place that the courts um, are an issue for us. Um, you know, as many folks know, when um, executive orders started coming out of governor's offices, some governors um, and politicians took advantage of this crisis to further threaten re you know, reproductive rights and access to abortion. So over the last month plus, Planned Parenthood and partners have filed suit in Texas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Ohio, Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, to protect access to essential abortion services during this pandemic. And I know those aren't the only states with executive orders and litigation. Um, so, you know, abortion is an essential time-sensitive medical procedure for an executive order to come out and, su and say that it is not and cut off access to that right um, is unacceptable. Reproductive rights simply are essential. Um, and Planned Parenthood and many other organizations, um, the ACLU, CRR, the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, have been, you know, bringing litigation to try and restore those rights. Um, each of those is in its own process point, and it will become challenging as states reopen. Um, and in some cases, we may see those executive orders become moot um, because, or, I'm sorry, that, that litigation become moot because executive orders are, are no longer in, um, in play. In other cases, we may see, you know, governors in um, the middle of a pandemic and a crisis took the moment to try and further erode rights, I think we should, we might expect that they will take another, another um, step in doing so, even as states reopen. Um, so I'm just gonna say again at a high level, our people are hurting and in a crisis where a lot was already at stake, just um, the impact that a pandemic has on the, on, in, in this moment, the world, um, but on a community, um, our people are hurting and anti-choice leaders are attacking our people's rights too. Um, and I know for me, this motivates me to find any way I can to take action, even when I'm sitting at my kitchen table. Um, so I'm gonna state one final impact, which I know is obvious to many of us as I talk to you all from my kitchen table, <laughs> full transparency, have pajama pants on <laughs> because we can do that in this reality. Um, but you know, the, the traditional ways that we know how to take action in a moment like this um, I know for myself as an organizer felt a little bit lost to me in the beginning. Um, so when I, when I see news of an executive order or I hear about one of these court cases getting argued, it, it fuels my, my um, anger and it makes me want to do something and what do you do? Um, so at the beginning I mentioned that I've learned a lot from colleagues at organizations um, that are, are paying attention to what's going on for women. And um, those organizations in this moment have chosen to come together virtually and form a coalition, the We Demand More Coalition. Um, we'll put in a link, or I'll type in a link into the chat um, when I'm done talking. Um, but our organizations have listed out five demands that 
um, you know, one of the demands draws focus to the attack on reproductive rights, but there are many other rights under threat too, and they're all interconnected. Um, our ability to vote is under threat. Um, literally, like, can we safely go to a ballot box? And when states find an alternative option, like vote by mail, is there equal access? Will voters know about it? Um, so voting rights are under attack. Obviously, economically, a lot is needed in many of the communities we care about. Um, so We Demand More has narrowed to five specific demands, and currently the coalition is working together to make sure that women are front and center in the next COVID package that Congress considers. Um, and the coalition will work together to make sure that, um, you know, the decision makers address the structural changes that made this such a mess always and make a crisis re much worse than is necessary. Um, so I look forward to working with those organizations, um, oh, you know, hopefully over the years to come. And I know later we'll get to tell you a little bit about how to get involved with actions um, like ones led by We Demand More. Thank you so much, Brianna. It's, just, it's infuriating to see what's happening, isn't it? And for me, as a disaster responder, you know, governors have to take action. They have to, they have to um, do an emergency declaration because they need federal funding, but they also have to describe the essential services and that when they are describing essential services, they also are describing the non-essential services and in some states, abortions included and sometimes it's not. So that's what Jordan Goldberg is here from the National Institute for Reproductive Health to really help us orient about what in the hell is going on with these states and how, if you are a person, a pregnant person in Texas, do you access? Um, so uh, Jordan um, is just an absolute policy rock star and I'm so delighted that you're here. So tell us, help us, Jordan. Thank you so much. You're so kind <laughs> and overly complimentary. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, give folks a sense of what's going on. But first, I just want to say thank you very much for having me on this webinar. Um, it is, it's always incredible to hear Heidi uh, speak and Brianna. And I've not gotten to work with the Women's March, but so it's really um, a great opportunity to hear what you're all working on. Um, my background, um, just quickly, I'm the Director of Policy at the Center at, at the National Institute for Reproductive Health. I've been here for a while. My whole mission and vision is to move proactive reproductive health policy to help protect our rights in the states and localities that we can move those policies in. And there are a lot. Um, we work at both the state and local level to move policy that will expand access rather than restrict it. Um, my background is that I'm an attorney. I worked at the Center for Reproductive Rights for a while. I did some litigation to protect abortion rights, and I tried to defeat a lot of bad abortion laws in the past. Um, so what's going on now is a total patchwork, which frankly, abortion access has been a patchwork for decades at this point. Um, states have quietly passed hundreds and hundreds of abortion restrictions over the last 10 years, certainly since Roe, but since the 2010 elections, since the red wave swept state le le legislatures and state houses, there have been tons of abortion restrictions. So getting an abortion in Texas, in Georgia, in Florida hasn't been easy for a long time um, and isn't easy in most places, even in you know, progressive states where you would think it would be. At this moment in the pandemic, there's so many different factors going on. Yes, there are politicians who have like callously and clearly taken advantage of a political opportunity to try to uh, reduce access. And thankfully, Planned Parenthood Federation and the Center for Reproductive Rights and the ACLU are taking them to court and are generally winning those cases. Um, plus, as Brianna said, a lot of them are getting mooted. But in the meantime, when clinics close and when patients don't know if they can get access, because today they heard in the newspaper that there is access and the next day that there's not, um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of things that flow from that that are bad. So I have here in the first bullet that many clinics are open because I want to make it clear that although there are some bad actors, most states even states with governors who oppose abortion care have not specifically targeted abortion care. They may not like it, but they've, like, they have not carved abortion out of essential health care services. And obviously, if you don't carve it out, abortion is an essential, time-sensitive reproductive health service, so you can get to it. Clinics are working 
so hard to stay open right now. They are putting in place social distancing. They are putting in place um, different ways of making sure that patients stay safe, that, that clinic staff stay safe. They are fighting against lack of protective equipment. They are fighting against politicians who don't want them to stay open. And frankly, one of the most horrifying things is they are fighting against a protester culture that does not care about COVID at all. And that will still bring protesters out in front of clinics who are not social distancing, who will come right up into a patient's face, who will come right up to staff. Um, I've heard stories from the, we work with many independent clinics, as well as working with Planned Parenthood. And I've heard stories where clinics are having patients wait in their cars for good reason, so that the patients do not uh, get exposed while sitting in the waiting room so that people can social distance, but it does make them a sitting duck for protesters who then walk right up to the, the car and try to stick their face in the hand pamphlets. Um, so the, the clinics are open in a lot of states, but there are challenges getting to them. The other thing um, that I know earlier speakers have talked about is telemedicine and telehealth. Um, there are federal regulations that make it difficult to make medication abortion as easy to access as it should be. Medication abortion is safe and effective, and study after study has shown that you can talk to a doctor or a healthcare provider like an APC, an advanced practice clinician, get diagnosed, and have pills sent to your house, and that will be safe. But the FDA does not allow that. And so providers are getting creative. They're doing what they can through telehealth. If you call an abortion provider today, you're going to talk to someone who's going to do the screening over the phone. They're going to do counseling over the phone. They're going to do everything they can before you walk in the door. There are also a few states, there are 13 states, where you can get a medication abortion through telemedicine, through something called the Teleabortion Project, and other states are being added. So I encourage folks to look at teleabortionproject.org, I believe. Um, we can send a follow in the follow-up notes. Figure out if your state is one of the states where you can get um, abortion pills actually mailed to your house. The protocol does require you to get an ultrasound, but there are um, situations in which that's not always necessary. The other thing, frankly, you're asking about Texas, Oklahoma places, and Arkansas places that have shut the clinics and then reopened and shut the clinics again. People are traveling. Women are actually getting in their cars and driving five hours to another state to get an abortion. We've heard lots of stories um, around the Louisiana area where people are trying to get out of Texas to Louisiana where there's only three abortion clinics or maybe there's five, um, and they're encountering problems, but, some, but people are doing that. And then the last thing I want to talk about, I know I only have like 30 seconds, is, um, is some people aren't accessing services, right? So there's people who either are going to end up carrying a pregnancy to term because they cannot get out of the situation that they're in. They can't travel. There's no clinics near them. They can't access the medication. Some of those women and others who become pregnant are going to self-manage their abortion. Um, NIRH has done a lot of work on decriminalizing self-managed abortion, it is really critical that if a woman decides to end her own pregnancy for whatever reason, that she not go to jail. But in the meantime, um, self-managing an abortion can be safe and effective with the right medications. Those medications are caught up in a global supply chain issue right now, even if it was legal to get them. So I just want to put a note on self-managed abortion that is a thing that is happening. It is not necessarily safe right now. And I encourage folks to look at if, when, how's website for more information about that. So that's basically the story. Thank you so much, Jordan. And go ahead and post some of those links that you talked about in the chat, and we'll, we'll provide that in follow-up. And I think the thing that strikes me the most is that these are policy decisions that are being made by elected officials. Governors, the 10 governors who protected reproductive health care services in their orders versus the 12 who tried to ban abortion explicitly. And and every single elected office has some impact upon protecting reproductive freedom. From your school board, to your district attorney, to your sheriff, to your state legislatures, most importantly. That's what Vote Pro-Choice is always very focused on, is electing pro-choice champions in every election, particularly state legislative races. So that is why we are so excited to have Representative Israel from the House of Representatives of Texas to talk about what it's like to be a pro-choice champion in Texas during this pandemic. And Representative Israel, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about yourself because you are such a true pro-choice champion and an amazing leader in the middle of a state that is just um, struggling politically in this pandemic. 
um, and talk a little bit about what it's like for you and what you're seeing on the ground um, as women and people and transgender people are trying to access reproductive health care services. Well, that's that's a lot, but thank you very much for, for your kind introduction. Uh, you've got some amazing uh, women, uh, really smart, who have who have set the set the groundwork here. Um, I am speaking to you from uh, Austin, Texas, and um, I'm a member of the Texas Legislature. The Texas Legislature is not in session right now. We meet every other year. We have what's called a part-time legislature in Texas, and for a lot of us on the progressive side, sometimes that's a really good thing. <laughs> But right now, of course, during an emergency situation, um, our governor is a Republican, Greg Abbott, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, the, the third most powerful person in, in Texas is the Speaker of the House, who's also unfortunately um, a, a Republican who does not support uh, women's access to a safe and legal abortion. So in that vein, um, uh, I'm looking at a list here of about eight different court uh, actions that have taken place and um, in, in the midst of a pandemic the one of the quotes that that strikes me is um, Alexis McGill Johnson who said this once again people in Texas are faced a nightmare within a nightmare and um, you know I, I think back on all the data that we're all hit with every day and each each data point is a tragedy it's, it's somebody who's struggling with COVID or it's somebody who's lost their life or it's a family and um, to know that uh, women and their families are being put through the roller coaster of the legal system right now um, is 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 tragic and um, um, and it is it is callous. Um, so in Texas, we have um, we have been through the political juggernaut, so to speak. We keep um, we keep fighting back against every uh, opportunity. Uh, that our our friends see to to use women's access to safe and legal abortion as a as a political piñata, and in Texas we um, we are we are exhausted from it, and to to know that we are just continue to drive to the bottom during a during a pandemic, and use this as not only an opportunity to to limit a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion, but to score political points is. Um, is horrifying. So that's that's the world that, that we live in. But I would like to say, because I know our next segment is about taking action, that there is a lot of hope in Texas in that um, if we, we have an opportunity in Texas to flip the House of Representatives, which will which means if we're if we're living in a um, we're, we're all living in a time of the United States Census is happening. A lot of the issues that we've been speaking to is about fair maps and gerrymandering and voters having a voice so that they can hold their elected officials accountable. Texas is, um, is uh, notorious for carving up its maps in, in, uh, in horrible ways so that we can um, quiet the voices of, of those who matter the most. And now the growth in Texas is largely young. It's largely people of color. And as we enter the next legislative session in January, we will have an opportunity to bring some equity to the table. But for now, um, we, we are getting ready for an election in November. I also chair the House Democratic Campaign Committee. We are nine seats away from flipping the House. Um, and I know this is not a, a partisan organization, but I, I feel like this is, it's important to say um, we, are, we are close to shifting the tide in Texas. And, and this is gonna be a game changer for all of us who care about good government. We, we have been destroying relationships and destroying institutions in Texas by having emotional fights on the House floor over, over women's health care. It is, is not, it's not what any of us want to do as, as we serve during our tenure of public service, but it's what we will do because the women of this country and of the state of Texas need us to do it. So we, we are getting geared up for a battle in January. And um, I, uh, I am sorry to say, to see that our statewide leaders um, went, went to this extreme. And, and of course, sad for the, for the women who are caught in this up and down of the court system. Uh, I, I very much uh, believe that there are women who are scrambling to Louisiana to, to get 
to get health care that the great state of Texas will, will not provide. And that's a sad statement because I, I love this state and I love public service. But we are, uh, we are going to turn the corner this November. And I hope that you guys will watch our progress wherever you are because we're going to make history. Yeah. Thank you so much, Representative. And, um, you know, it's absolutely great to have a call to action to be keep your eye on Texas. Yeah. Um, we'll make lots of asks like that. Uh, and thank you continually for your service and for being a true pro a champion of reproductive health. Um, hopefully we can change things. And as you can tell, obviously, um, all, of this is, all of this requires us to be collectively mobilizing to action. And this pandemic has created a universe that feels like it's it's not our normal mode of, mode of operation. We can't all be in the streets like Women's March has taught us how to do, and we can't all be protesting the Supreme Court like we're so very good at. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to, but if I have to, I will lay myself on the ground in front of the Supreme Court. I don't care. That's where we're at. Um, so we have to figure out how to take action. And that's why I'm so delighted to have Mary Drummer, who's here from Move On, because Move On is just, they're experts at digital mobilization and digital organizing. So um, Mary is um, focused on the reproductive justice and reproductive rights organizing that Move On does, but we really want to get a picture of like, what do we do in this situation? Nobody knows this stuff better than you. So Mary, let's shift into some calls to action, then we'll do some Q&A and we're gonna go really deep into what the hell do we do. So lead us there. Awesome, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I used to live in Texas for four years, it's a really big deal. I worked in an abortion fund and I was there. And even before um, COVID and the pandemic and everything, folks were still like having to go out of state to access the care they needed just because of all the restrictions that we've been dealing with. So right now, how do we fight back and what's going on? Well, a lot of things are going on, as we all know, it's kind of hectic. Um, right now, as Jordan mentioned earlier, one of the ways we can fight back is through expanding access to abortion care, and we can do that through telemedicine abortion care, through medication abortion. Um, right now, there are 18 states that restrict telem telemedicine abortion care. Um, the FDA has really hard um, struck up restrictions on it as well. And we know there are um, anti-abortion groups who are lobbying the FDA and Health and Human Service Secretary as um, Alzar in order to keep these restrictions in place. Telemedicine abortion, as with the Jordan mentioned, is completely safe. It's, there are very few complications. Other countries do it. There's no reason why we can't. Um, and once again, the representative was saying earlier, What's going on right now is that these anti-choice politicians are using this pandemic as a way, they're exploiting it to push their extremely unpopular anti-choice agenda and restrict access, and that's what's going on. Now, usually the ways we protest would be, again, going out to the streets, doing things like that, doing lobby visits with the pandemic, and we can't do those anymore because we want to be safe and healthy. So we have to go to the digital space. Last week, my colleagues and I at Move On, we did our first digital rally about um, folks who need real relief have been infected by coronavirus. And so we're sharing their stories using the hashtag real relief now, and we're able to get trending to number three on Twitter. You know, I know we do, I know Move On, I know Women's March does, I know Planned Parenthood does. A lot of these larger groups have really awesome text programs. And maybe normally you say, oh, I'm tired of text. I'll just go into the streets. Well, we can't go in the streets now, so now we do digital. It's a great chance to get signed up to their um, text list as well as well, their email list also, because that's how we're going to be able to know what's going on and how to get mobilized. Since we can only do it digitally now, we can't really go out into the streets. Another great way, call, mail, text, go old school. Call your representative at the federal level and also the state level. You know, mail, support the USPS, buy some stamps and some envelopes and mail them things too. And also again, the texting programs. Move on our platform, we have some really great petitions. We actually have a petition right now. We partnered with Ultraviolet on about pushing the FDA to um, get rid of those restrictions on telemedicine abortion. And I can share the link in the chat as soon as I'm done. So that's how we can definitely fight back with this. 
um, in the context of larger things, once again, we know that anti-abortion groups are also in the ears and lobbying and these extreme politicians and they're trying to put in restrictions into any coronavirus relief packages. They targeted Planned Parenthood already for one in terms of small business loans. And right now there's a health insurance relief package they're talking about and they're trying to insert Hyde Amendment language which will ban any insurance recovering abortion care. We can't let them be the loudest voice in the room. We have to be the loudest voice in the room because we know we are in the majority. Majority of Americans support abortion access. And that's extremely important. Another case also is we see these reopen protests. And basically what that comes down to, it's a very vocal minority who are using violence to intimidate and threaten politicians to do their bidding. And they're completely going against any, all kind of medical advice, which not surprisingly is what they enjoy doing, as we have seen. But not only that, they're pushing to reopen, and we know that what's going to happen with that is going to be, again, communities of color, black and brown communities, who will suffer disproportionately from that, as we've seen all throughout this pandemic. It's been black and brown communities who have had the most um, diagnosis of coronavirus, who have had the highest rates of death as well. And we know that most of these folks, essential workers, are, again, black and brown folks, generally black women in particular. And it's not surprising also that when it comes to abortion restrictions, this is the same community that also suffers the most when these restrictions happen. So all of this is, in connect, is interconnected as well, which is, again, a good reason to really pay attention at the local level, at the state level, and we have to get pro-choice champions in offices as well, too. From, I mean, we've seen from 2010, the past 10 years, just an onslaught of restrictions, most come from the state level. We have a chance to turn Texas House of Representatives, which is really fantastic. And there are other states too. We've seen what happened after the midterm elections in 2018 in Nevada, Illinois, in Virginia. When we got these pro-choice majorities in there, they removed abortion restrictions. And that can happen anywhere too. And just because you live in a safe blue state, access is still an issue. Before I came home to Ohio, I was in California for a year. And as liberal as California is when it comes to abortion um, laws and regulations, access is still an issue. Folks in the rural part of the state had a very difficult time getting to a clinic to get their appointments. They had a very difficult time covering the cost, things like that. Which is why we also have to push for proactive policies too. So there is definitely more that we can do and more fights. And again, and if you're in a blue state, you already have, you know, pro-choice champions in office. So it's not as heavy as a lift, but it's still a lift. I don't want to diminish that work. But it's really important that we do all that we can to expand access because none of us are free until all of us are free. And that includes most marginalized among us. Oh, yes. So I am so grateful for all of you amazing warriors that we all get to fight together. Um, as you can tell, uh, these are folks that know what they're talking about. So now we get to talk with all of you. Um, so panelists and all of the participants out there, thank you all for joining us. Um, do you have any questions or do you have any comments that you'd like to, ch to share with each other? Rachel. We have a couple and one I think is really fundamental and a lot of people kind of move to the more complicated questions before asking this one. So let's just start begin at the beginning like I always like to do. If Roe versus Wade is the law of the land, how can states enact these restrictions? How, is that, how does that work? I can maybe answer that. So a lot of the restrictions are on attacking Roe directly. Um, in 1992, SCOTUS ruled in Planned Parenthood v. Casey that the state has a vested interest in protecting, um, and you can't place an undue burden, but they didn't define what undue burden exactly was, and that's a problem. And they also have an interest in protecting the, in protecting the potential light as well. And once again, it's still kind of blurry about that. So these restrictions, particularly trap laws, like which are targeted regulation of abortion providers. So things that we're seeing this Louisiana case is about um, how the clinics to be ambul amb sorry, ambulatory surgery centers, the highway width has to be a certain amount, all of these things. Doctors have to have you know, admitting privileges to um, the nearby hospital, all of those things too. They're not attacking the procedure directly, but everything around it. Also including with the um, 24 to 72 hour waiting periods in some states also. And their claim is that it's to protect the health. 
um, all around of the patient and of everyone involved. And that's what their claim is, even though they're completely unfounded and many health providers have over years have mentioned how these don't do anything. Abortions are already an incredibly safe procedure. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I add one thing to that? Um, just to say, and Mary, I think is, is right about all of that, but also um, Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973 and it laid a particular floor down. And then in 92, when the court dipped below that floor, it kind of opened the gates for states to kind of throw spaghetti at the wall to see what courts would uphold. And so a lot of restrictions were put in place that may not actually comport with either any of the things the court has said, but until litigation goes through the system and you have a lot of different judges and not everything gets to the Supreme Court. So you have really a patchwork of restrictions from delays, to requirements that women who are getting an abortion look at an ultrasound screen, to requiring women to hear biased information, to actual bans at particular points in pregnancy, all of which like might be unconstitutional under various Supreme Court cases, but is still the law of the land in a bunch of states. And so I think the, the really key thing to keep in mind is Roe exists in some part and Casey does too, but, um, but unless you litigate each and everything that happens, the reality on the ground is a balance between what the state lawmakers have decided to do and what litigants, litigants are able to push back on. And so you don't end up with access for all in any way. Yeah. And we just have to do better by people. You know, that's why policymakers like the representative and the folks that we're going to be electing in the next cycle of elections just have to do a better job of, of creating better foundations and protections for reproductive health. That's the, that's like teasing your call to action. I'm gonna um, push two questions together because they're very related. Um, what can non-professional activists do that's meaningful with a lot of leverage, but also realistic um, and not intimidating, um, particularly with the digital lens, um, which is the other question um, that can kind of help as many people as possible. I can jump in um, and I'm sure others have some um, points as well, but um, one thing that I've tried to keep in mind as an organizer, I've organized my entire career, um, the, the definition of power might look different, but it hasn't changed. Um, legislators uh, or elected officials and uh, maybe my colleagues on the um, on the panel can affirm this, but you know they've they've pursued public office for a reason, and presumably they want to keep that job, um, and that means that they care about the volume of people who will vote them in and who who won't. Um, so, for whether you're a professional um, person working in this issue or you're, um, you know a person who cares about the issue um, in your volunteer time, I think working toward finding the people who agree with you, uh, with you on the issue and making it known that all of you feel a certain way still works. Um, so as I'll give you two very concrete, I'll give you three very concrete examples and this is maybe taking my like, my what I would say later in my calls to action. Lots of organizations have shifted into running virtual volunteer programs. I know Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Now every Wednesday, um, I was just on it last night at 8 p.m. You can get on the phone and folks have rapidly um, scaled up digital organizing tools. So you can, you can download something called Outvote. It syncs up with your contacts. Last night I texted 45 of my friends. It was great. I got reconnected with 10 of them that I haven't talked to in a decade. And now we're all talking about abortion. Um, and, and what I texted to them was go sign the We Demand More Coalition uh, petition because by May 18th, the coalition has a goal of getting, I'm like scared to say the number <laughs> and put on a public call that it sounds like someone is recording, but a lot of signatures. Don't be scared, we'll get there. <laughs> at least 100,000 signatures. And ideally, right. given the size of our organization's um, constituencies, many, many more than that. And we, we will deliver that to Congress alongside the specific demands that need to be in the fourth COVID package um, to support women. So I'm just naming like the definition of power is still the same and all of the things that 
you used to do to be united with people still matter. It just may happen differently. Download the apps, do the virtual volunteer calls. Uh, I, this is Celia. I, I, I feel compelled to speak up on behalf of those people who might think I don't have a lot of money and I don't know who all the candidates are. Um, as chair of the HDCC, we work with so many progressive partners like Planned Parenthood, um, like Annie's List here in Texas, who support pro-choice women. And um, they, they, can, they, can, they would use your help. And if you can give $25 or $2,500, or you can just give $10 a month, these organizations are set up and designed to say, we, we will make sure that your money goes to those candidates who are pro-choice, who will fight for what you believe in. And, they're, and, and, they're, and those candidates and those campaigns are, are, putting, are being put through the rigors and put through the paces that a PAC does that you don't have to do. So you don't have to know what, what are the 10 races in the country that I wanna have an impact. Uh, find an organization that is regionally based or state based that, um, that is also a pro-choice organization and you know, give them a little bit of money that you're bundling your money with other money um, means big muscle. So uh, I, I, wanna just, I just wanna encourage everyone for, to help where you can, when you can. Every little bit. Yeah, it adds up. <laughs> we're, we're, most of us do this $10 at a time is the reality. Um, you know, the small dollar donors in today's landscape are much more plentiful than the large dollar ones. So yeah, nothing is too small, no contribution, no volunteering or um, donation. So yeah, do what you can. Every little grain helps. It, it gets us to the avalanche. <laughs> I want to do like a really quick round robin, try to mix up the response kind of a little bit and keep everyone on their toes. There's a question of where should I get news about this? Could we just go one by one through the um, presenters, um, starting with um, Heidi and moving to Mary, um, and then just kind of going um, and just say, like, where do you get your news? I'm a, huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of Rewire. Um, they are a um, news site that's focused entirely on reproductive rights and justice. We go to Mary and then go to um, Representative Israel. I was just seeing during Rewire is fantastic. Um, I also like on social media, on Twitter, I follow different reproductive rights groups, um, abortion funds, we testify, sister song, black women's um, health imperative, so many different orgs too. And they're also um, posting some really great articles and stuff and give you different perspectives of what's going on. Okay, representative and then going to Jordan next. Well, it will not come as a surprise to you that I'm uh, Texas centric. So I will say um, there's there's no organization that covers state politics better in Texas than the Texas Tribune dot org. Um, I'm a politician who would much rather talk about support for mass transit and clean air and um, elections laws. But I, I, as I said in my comments, I will always be there to stand up for uh, women's access to a safe and legal abortion. But in, I mentioned that because in, this, in the scheme of things, there's, just, there's big rocks and there's big issues that we're not addressing because we're fighting over this other stuff. So um, watch texastribune.org, very well written, of, um, a, a, an abundance of information on all kinds of issues. And then um, we'll go to Jordan next and then Brianna. I think I would, I would echo what everybody said. Um, in particular, if you're very interested in reproductive rights issues, I would follow on social media, all of the organizations, you know, Planned Parenthood, NRH, we post all the different things that are happening in real time. And a lot of us really focus on the state level. So we will be posting stuff that's about a lot of the states that you live in. Um, and then personally, I, I think Vox and Slate both do a really good job of, of explaining the nitty gritty of what's going on and the Times editorial page has been really interested in this issue for the last couple of years. Um, I'll also echo everyone. I wake up in the morning and scan through Twitter. Um, but the one other thing I'll add into the mix, and this isn't for everyone, and I don't always have the stomach for it, but it doesn't hurt to read the news that our opposition is circulating on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, I don't wanna advertise any of them, but I will say that like National Review had an article 
um, recently that I was like, oh, it's interesting to see how you all think this is. Um, so that could be another, if you've got the stomach for it, source of news. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I'm going to, I'm going to mash up. I'm going to do a mash up again of two questions. Um, and one of them is just really, we've seen, you know, the attacks that have happened um, on our reproductive freedom, certainly over many years, certainly over the last few years. So what would it take to, for us to actually be protected? If Roe is insufficient, if, if previous court cases are insufficient, is the ERA something that could be used um, is, a, is a secondary question that someone raised. So what could actually protect us? I can jump in first and, yes. you know. I would, I would have, I have called a couple in. Yes, I would have called ahead. I would have absolutely yeah. called on you, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I think folks should think about a couple things. Um, I think there are, you know, to have like perfect protection for reproductive rights across the country, you would need either a better Supreme Court or a Congress to act. And there is pending congressional legislation called the Women's Health Protection Act that would go, you know, far in that direction. Um, and I know Planned Parenthood and others are really moving that, that bill as much as possible, but frankly, it's unlikely to move in this Congress or the next Congress. Um, but at the state level, there is a lot you can do. Um, and I, I will plug NIRH's website just because we have a lot of information on there about state and local action that people can take. It shouldn't be a patchwork, but it's gonna be a patchwork for the next period of time. And so we can each in our own communities do something to make sure that women and others to become pregnant can have access in the communities we live in, both at the local level and at the state level. We can pass a law in your state protecting rights, expanding access, protect, providing insurance coverage for literally everyone. Like there are a lot of things you can do. Um, so I don't, I want to start with that because if you just think about Congress, you kind of get discouraged and it's important to focus some energy there, but we all live in the community we live in and we can do something there. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, and I know we didn't get to everybody, um, so we will add um, one of the things I'll just note for the, um, for the uh, panelists is um, we quoted a, a statistic of 80% of the public um, does not want Roe versus Wade overturned. Um, so why? you know, what happens? Um, why does, why does, why are, how are um, anti-choice officials elected? Um, so I'm wondering if we can put some stats in our email, if we can make a note to ourselves. Um, and the question that I want to end with is, what are the current stats? Um, and can we please share resources on how further restrictions on um, reproductive freedom in the midst of COVID-19 have disproportionately impacted Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other marginalized women? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm sure others have a lot to add here, but um, the, when I read that question, I was gonna type an answer and then I was like, oh, I'm so mad because um, I think like, like with uh, the experience of women, um, I don't know that we're, I don't know that, mm, I'm gonna say mainstream, I hate that word, I'm sorry, okay. um, but I don't know that mainstream um, organizations and outlets that are doing research are paying enough attention to what's happening to people of color. Um, so, you know, I don't have at my fingertips a report that clarifies the unique experience. I have in my head the knowledge that, um, Black maternal health was, you know, unacceptable before this, and given all the complications for um, giving birth now, and et cetera, et cetera, like, we know that it is not good. We know that all of the structural changes, um, structural racism, um, the way that we have not supported low-income people, all of those problems, of course, are worse in a crisis. They were a crisis before this, and now we've layered over that a pandemic. So, um, I do I do have some um, data, and I'm uh, from organizations like Moms Rising. I know has shared a lot. I've learned a lot from them. Um, but I will see if we can put together a one pager of some sort with the information, at least that I know of. But I just want to honor that, like. I don't think we're doing right by communities of color right now, and we do need to pay better attention to the unique impact on them right now. Thank you. I absolutely agree with Brianna. And I also want to point out too that 
Um, in terms of reproductive like health access for communities of color, like in general, it had already been like a systemic issue, kind of like you know almost a failure. Really, we know that when it comes to even accessing like comprehensive sex ed, that's an issue. Um, schools of predominantly people of color are very underfunded. They don't get the right education they need in terms of sexual health and things like that in schools. Plus, lack of access to contraception, those things. Um, the maternal mortality rate, and even when you know you account for like access to um, income, socioeconomic status, access to health insurance, it still is because of structural racism in the medical industry. That's something that we have to deal with as well. So once again, once you put a crisis, it just exacerbates all the inequities that were already in that system. When I worked for an abortion fund, I know the majority of our patients were people of color as well because they're most likely to be uninsured, most likely to have low-income jobs, and needed help paying for their abortion procedure. They needed help paying for travel and lodging to get to the clinic to go long distances and things like that. And these were already problems before this pandemic happened, and now it's just like blowing everything completely wide open. Thank you. And now, in our last two minutes, we have the most important part of the presentation, which is the calls to action. So we'll go around, and, and you've already given so many. We will collect all of them and make sure that they're sent out to everyone that RSVP to the webinar. But what are the real calls to action? I can start, give you an example. Vote pro-choice means voting all the way down the ballot through the lens of reproductive freedom. We are doing a um, comprehensive Georgia primary voter guide that will have every election and give you help on who the heck you're supposed to vote for um, through that lens of reproductive freedom. It will be released next week and the Georgia election um, primary is on June 9th. And then we'll have our national voter guide released in mid-October. So sign up, voteprochoice.us. Let's get all of these anti-choice politicians out in every election. So who's next? Mary. Awesome. Um, if you text the word freedom to 668-366, You'll sign the petition asking um, the FDA to remove those restrictions telemedicine abortion care. You can also go to our website, moveon.org slash repo freedom. Start your own petition in your state, in your community, whatever you want to do, and get that spread out. And then once you do that, you can message signers and you can like start building this community of folks digitally. And then y'all can plan and go from there. And I will drop that information in the chat also. Thank you. Rep Israel. Well, I, I will, um, my, my world right now is occupied with a singular political task and that is to flip the Texas House. So if you want to track our progress, I invite you to go to our uh, newly reformatted website, texashdcc.com. You can sign up to get updates and see how we're doing. And um, we're going to make history this November and I welcome you all to Texas. Come, come and join the fun. Happily. <laughs> Jordan. Yeah, um, we actually do less individual organizing, but I would just encourage everyone who's interested in state um, access to reproductive health care policy and local policy to get on our list, and we will update you about everything that's going on in the 25 states that we're actively working in and a lot of the other ones that we work with partners in. So um, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. And Brianna? Um, I dropped some links in the chat. I will say one other thing that I don't have a good link for, but pay attention to how voting is going to happen in your state and city. Um, and double check as early as you can um, if you need to request a ballot, if you, etc. Just make sure you can vote and then support pro um, reproductive health rights and justice candidates. Yeah. And Rachel, Women's March. Bring us home. Since Brianna just uh, hyped the voting, uh, I'll hype the We Demand More uh, Coalition, which we are a proud um, partner of. So wedemandmore.org. And um, I would just, I'll leave it to Heidi to have the last word because Heidi is always good at keep, keeping us in our energy and our spirit, um, which uh, as my allergies have continued to rage, I'm... I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so much there, but I just wanted to read something that someone shared with us in the chat. Um, and we had asked one of our uh, 
participants if we could have the permission to read this and when, when I said why why are you interested in this webinar um, she said because I don't want any young woman to ever have to go through what I went through in 1969 before abortion was legal I had to drive from Los Angeles all the way to Juarez to get a safe abortion in a real clinic by a real doctor I was a scared 20 year old and you know we really focus a lot on thinking about what is the what is the you know the experience in the room um, you know women so often are told that we are not the own the, the the experts in our experience and just in this call right here we have folks that went through this this outcome that we're trying to fight against and avoid and so what I really just want to say is it's so hard right now coronavirus COVID-19 all the assaults there's kids in cages on the border. There's, you know, threat of, in, the, in this year alone, we've had, a, you know, an economic collapse, uh, a pandemic. We almost went to war. Let's not forget about that. That seems like distant history. And so I would just say, keep the faith because there are so many women that fought so hard for us to get here that we can't let ourselves or them down. And we have to keep our imaginations focused on that future where we choose when we, we have the freedom to decide when and how we have families and where we have the freedom to control what happens with our bodies. And so that's just what I would say to people is that it's a, it's, we're walking a hard road, but we're walking together. And I really thank everybody who was both on this panel and who joined us for the webinar. And Heidi, I'll kick it to you. There is absolutely nothing that I could add to that beautiful um, closing. So just thank you and remember that we have all the power we need when we stick together. So good night, everybody, and take good, good care of yourself. Be safe, be healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.